Now, um, we have a panel discussion on regulation. So, what about all the questions that we have around uh, how to get these uh, powerful and uh, useful treatments to the most, uh, um, yeah, to, yeah, in, in, a, in a more um, easy way for society. So, we still need a chair on the, uh, thank you so much, Valeria. And uh, please, um, uh, I welcome uh, the speakers for this panel. You will see them also in the booklet. Thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> and of course, um, for ça. Ah ouais. yeah, we can see their name uh, there in this slide. Adrian <laughs> Schwende is a member uh, of the Federal Office of, the of Health in Switzerland, BAG. OFSP, Office Federal de la Santé Publique, and he is um, supervising the compassionate use in Switzerland, among other things. Um, Federica Olze, postdoc uh, researcher doing uh, psychedelics assisted uh, doing a therapy with, um, no, doing research, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, in any case, uh, she was also there last year as a speaker a research in psychedelics, a researcher in psychedelics. Uh, Gabriel Torrance, um, um, psychiatrist at the Geneva University Hospital, specialized in psychiatry and addictology in a department at the university where we um, provide psychedelic assisted psychotherapy uh, to patients. Helena Eicher, uh, she is a PhD student in Zurich University, working on um, analogs of ayahuasca, we will be able to uh, listen to her work uh, in uh, another talk during these three days. So, um, maybe you already have um, um, something like a comment around this day or around psychedelic psychotherapy that you, can, that you want to, to freely share. We have a discussion on uh, the legal context of psychedelics. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can uh, take the, the opportunity to clarify um, terminological confusion, I think. You, I heard a lot the term um, uh, compassionate use. And uh, at least in Switzerland, uh, compassionate use is not really um, a concept uh, from the narcotics law that we use to, to authorize um, psychedelic therapies but it's um, a concept from a therapeutical products law, which means uh, that uh, in a clinical when you have a drug in a clinical study that is not yet uh, on the market, you can exceptionally or you can uh, get an authorization to apply it to patients outside of the study. And it, ha it has nothing to do with, um, with narcotics uh, per se. Yeah. So I think what the term that we normally use uh, to approve psychedelic therapies is a uh, limited medical use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this mm -hmm. is all about terminology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I mean, this is very important, in fact, to, to Surline because um, it comes really from different perspectives as of the regulation of these substances and their use. Uh, so, yeah, it's a limited, exceptional medical use of a substance that is normally illegal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we were discussing a bit before, and the only way for the therapist to continue to do this treatment is really to uh, be aware that is this limited uh, use and that at the time it's patient by patient. And we have to be very careful on what indication we can provide and uh, in which setting we are doing this. Because obviously, uh, as we see here, there's a lot of uh, attention about these treatments. and there's a big difference between giving this treatment in a research setting and a therapeutical setting. And in Switzerland, we have the chance to be able to do it in a therapeutical setting, as we do in our hospital. But it means that we have to be very careful on the indication. And we are always 
uh, aware that the final decision comes from uh, the people who are getting the, the file of our patient and getting the approval. So uh, one of the questions is also how we can communicate and what guidelines we can put and things like that, which are very important to continue and see the, the future of those treatments. Yeah, so I think that's a, a topic of implementation and sometimes when we see all these uh, clinical trials and they look very promising and we hear that MDMA might be on the market in two years, I think what we tend to um, maybe forget or m we don't forget it, but what will be a topic is that um, it's not only about the medicalization of MDMA, but that we also need therapists and take care of all the extra pharmacological factors that in practice we don't have a manualized or a standardized treatment. We will have patients with comorbidities, which we often don't have in clinical trials. So we're really not there yet, I think. I think in Switzerland we really have this beautiful chance of this limited um, use, but this is also not a long-term solution because it's really patient by patient. Um, so I think this gives a lot of flexibility because it's um, based on the expertise of each um, uh, clinician who has the permit for, uh, to work with one patient. But uh, long term, when we want to treat all these um, many people, uh, we have other challenges, challenges to solve, I think, especially also regarding uh, training of therapists as well. Yeah, so this opens up uh, many uh, venues for uh, keeping the discussion. One of the questions that we wanted to ask uh, you is, in fact, if you foresee um, a, a developing of this uh, regulation in Switzerland. So how could we imagine this? And also the question of the um, training. Of course, uh, there is also science that has to be made on that to see how it works and uh, if it's uh, evidence-based, uh, so, but... At the moment it's called a limited use program and the question is how this will develop, develop within the next years. And I think as soon as one to, or as soon as some medications will get medicalized or legal or um, approved in some countries in the world, it doesn't mean yet that it will get approved in Switzerland. But we still have like the limited use program so that we can already use them. So at some point, the limited use program might therefore become obsolete because there we have already there we have medications that are approved. But maybe it, they are approved for a certain indication and not for like all the indications. And then we might still need the limited use program. I mean, the same way it's with Spravato and Ketamine. Um, it's approved for treatment-resistant depression, but there is still, you, you can still use it off-label. So, but then you can not use the Spravato, but you have to get a, another ketamine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we should agree what we talk about when we speak uh, um, about regulation, I guess we talk about medical use of psychedelics and uh, not recreational use. And um, I mean, one option is to just um, to lift a ban on uh, the prohibition of uh, psychedelics in the narcotics law, uh, Article 8. Um, we have lifted this year on 1st of August, uh, the, the ban on uh, cannabis for medical use. And I think Switzerland is still prevailing. But um, on the other hand, um, it's clear that there is much more um, experience, clinical experience, and also uh, there are more studies, even if they are also not very strong, uh, which um, laid the ground for this step. So uh, for, the, for really um, lifting uh, the, this regime of uh, uh, exceptional authorizations, it, it would need a political uh, will, a political need to do that. I think right now, um, the, 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 this is the issue of uh, also a formation of, uh, of specialists, of psych psychiatrists, etc. 
we are really um, well off in Switzerland with this regime. We have a lot of flexibility. Um, if uh, if uh, it's enlarged, it needs a lot more, a lot more uh, clinical people that are trained to use psychedelics in the therapies. Um, and I think the way to go there would really be uh, to have better uh, research evidence. So um, already now, uh, already today with this, uh, with the ban on uh, psychedelics, uh, if uh, in, in, um, in, um, in some uh, comparable uh, com um, uh, state uh, of the OECD, uh, one of these drugs is um, registered or is, it, uh, um, is um, made accessible or authorized under the uh, therapeutics law, uh, then uh, it can also be prescribed in Switzerland directly. Swiss Medic just will formally um, uh, register the drug as um, uh, authorized uh, if, for example, the FDA is now approving uh, uh, psilocybin or, or MDMA. Um, and that's already possible now. Then uh, there is no need for, a, for a exceptional authorization. Uh, for this, we don't need to change the law. For this, we need uh, very good quality studies, clinical studies, uh, studies that you know are going on. Uh, and I think that's the, the way to go. And only when we have better evidence for this, um, it's also, the, I think, the politics will be ready to, to change the law. This, for sure, I think we all agree uh, around uh, uh, the psychedelic science here and this method. Um, so if I understood it correctly, the moment, uh, for example, MDMA would be approved by the FDA, that would pass directly, um, like within a process, but that would pass without remaking all the research on MDMA as a, for a medication legally prescribable in Switzerland. Right. Yes. And you think that after it's medicalized, that the legalization will follow naturally from the political perspective? Or I mean, mm. it can go different ways. Yeah. If it goes the same way like cannabis, the, the use is just increasing. We get more and more uh, exceptional authorization. Uh, we get the demands for exceptional authorizations. Uh, and then uh, at a certain point in time, we have to admit that this is not exceptional anymore. <laughs> but it depends, of course, on certain uh, indications. And with the psychedelics, maybe even more than with uh, cannabis, uh, especially in the area of psychiatry, you there are so many indications, potential indications. So it's also tricky to have uh, big studies, uh, clinical mm. studies, phase three studies that will um, show the, yeah, the effectiveness and uh, safety. Uh, safety will, will be rather easy, but the, the effectiveness of the, of, of the drugs. Yeah, and just as uh, Rick said, for example, there are other indications that are not medical indications, such as like couple therapy. So I know from practice that we at the moment can apply for both individuals if they have medical conditions that uh, make them like accessible for, uh, for the treatment, and then we can still combine them, but um, the whole topic about recreation use or uh, ceremonial use, um, that's not solved, right? Uh, I mean, it's not solved with uh, all the drugs that are, uh, that are uh, in our medical system. There are a lot of drugs that are used recreationally. And I mean, this is a, is a question of uh, what kind of medical system we have. Self-medication is not considered to be a medical um, a medical uh, uh, use by law, legally, uh, in our so uh, in our society, and um, of course that doesn't mean it, it's culturally not medical or something, or it ha has not a medical purpose. But uh, it's not um, it's not in the context of the medical system, and um, therefore, I assume that it's definitely important to have more uh, research on that. And uh, it won't start probably with uh, these uh, very particular um, indications, couple therapy, etc. It's a tricky one. I mean, <laughs> um, I'm sure that when cannabis will be, um, a lot of stress will be taken out of the medical system to now, when we have the legalization of cannibal, cannabis for medical purposes, to now prescribe it for an indication that is not really 
um, is not really uh, meant to be medical. So people are going to doctors and say, I need it for this and that purpose, I cannot sleep, and it's not a very clear indication. So it would be better to have an access also recreationally, so people can, whether they do it for medical purposes or really recreational purposes, doesn't matter. So, I mean, that's another discussion, and I, I'm sure first comes the, the, the medical um, access in a strict sense. Yeah, no, I, I think it's very important because we uh, spoke a lot about psychotherapy, but I think this is also the core of the treatment. And if uh, we do uh, misinterpretation between medical use and recreational use, there's going to be this boundary that's going to fade, and this is worse, and this is bad for the, uh, for the treatment. So uh, this is also important to say that medical use uh, must be accompanied by uh, psychotherapy for specific indication. And this is really in the medical world. And as we have seen with other drugs, and we can take example, as you said, cannabis or even opiates, huh? we have the strict medical use for pain, and this is uh, not questionable and always used. And there's the recreational use. And there's always going to be this difference, but this difference has to be really clear. And the more it is clear, the more we're going to go to uh, legalization uh, in terms of not legalization, but in terms of uh, medical use and specific and uh, evidence based medical use. Mm -hmm. So we are touching already uh, a huge variety of um, things, also some questions we prepared and we shared with you. Maybe we can just go on and ask uh, the public if there are some questions. And then, um, yeah? Yes, the public is boiling, so there's people here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello? Hi, I've got... Shall I go ahead? Yes, please. Uh, um, well, first to say, I'm extremely jealous and envious of your wonderful position here in Switzerland. Um, I've been lobbying successive UK governments for over 15 years to have some kind of compassionate use, pre-approval for MDMA and psilocybin, and we've got precisely nowhere with every single different sort of government. Um, of course, we like a new prime minister every month anyway. But, um, <laughs> so it's, it's completely failed all the time that myself and Professor David Nurt, my colleague, have tried to get this across the line. So the first question is, you know, what, how did you do it? Is it just something about um, the politics in Switzerland, the general public in Switzerland? What is it that you're doing that we've been unable to achieve? And the second question, which is linked to that, is just what, what sort of level of scrutiny is there around what you're doing um, in terms of specialist training, collecting safety and efficacy data, supervision, and can an individual's license be revoked very easily with quite high levels of scrutiny, um, given the sort of very luxurious position you've got? Thank you for this question. <laughs> um, I'm trying to get some <coughs> answers. Um, I think the, the reason that we are where we are now in Switzerland um, is twofold. First, it's, it's just the history of psychedelics that are connected with the country, of course. Um, you know it, uh, LSD, uh, Hoffman, uh, Laroche, um, the inventor, uh, etc. I mean, this is certainly something that I'm, I'm sure it has helped to re-establish uh, acceptance of, of um, psychedelics in, in, um, also in the administration, in the politics and in the broader uh, society. Because, um, yeah, these people that were really uh, since a long time um, yeah, researching on psychedelics, it never totally stopped and, and they always were, were very... Um, very uh, focused to keep it uh, uh, research in a strict sense and uh, to, to well, well, somehow rehabilitate it um, also for the broader society. The second uh, aspect is that uh, in Switzerland we really had this huge opioid crisis or the heroin crisis, you probably know it in the beginning of, end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, where the drug policy overall shifted uh, uh, towards a more medical approach to, to substances. 
um, medicalization. Of course, today we are, uh, it's also criticized again because um, it's, uh, it's, it might, for recreational drug use, it's not the solution. But it helped us to, to cope with the, the huge uh, heroin epidemics that we had in the beginning of the 90s. Um, and I think that ch changed the mindset in the, um, in the politics, in the administration, uh, really to see, okay, um, how can we tackle um, um, these substances more, more, um, more uh, rationally um, and create a regime that um, allows a more safe use. Now, your last po uh, question was uh, uh, re uh, uh, regarding and the safety measures we take, the regime. Honestly, it's not really standardized because this started so much experimentally and um, the, uh, the, this uh, limited medical use is really meant for, um, for experimental treatments in a sense. So we also didn't have a lot of uh, standards uh, and, um, and measures to, to guarantee these standards uh, from our side, from the administration's side. Um, now that it's expanding, now that we have a bit more evidence base, this is really a very important uh, now step that we have to take. Um, and we expect also the professionals, the medical societies, uh, SEPT, uh, all, the, all the researchers and the, the clinical physicians to, to professionalize the formation, to create ethical standards or define ethical standards. We believe this is really highly important. We can also encourage, we cannot not only encourage this, but also support these measures, but it has to come from the professionals in our opinion. Uh, and we ourselves, we, we define more strict criteria in or more strict, more concrete criteria as to uh, what are the preconditions or the conditions for uh, exceptional author um, authorization it's, uh, for psychedelics? We are uh, on the way. Um, we are on the way to to really go further in this area. But I think much must come from the professional side. Yeah, I think I would like to add on that what you just said that now it's growing. I think a part of the um, history was that Switzerland is also very small. It has a history. It has this um, sept, and the people know each other, and it's also kind of a feedback loop that people do intuition. And there's a lot of implicit knowledge and experience, which has only partly been made explicit. And I think in the next steps, this is a, a task to make this knowledge and experience also explicit. And um, there are some ethical standards already available also by the sept, but to make the this a bit more concrete as the demand grows now. Just to give you a, a precision to the public, uh, which is coming also from other countries, the SEPT is this Swiss Medical Society for Psychedelic Assisted Psychotherapy. So it, so it was find, founded uh, in the 90s. I found... 86. <laughs> so there are members of this <laughs> society here, of course. And... Um, and uh, this is where uh, the um, yeah the experience comes from in this country. So I would like also to emphasize on the research part, and uh, I could be pleased to hear Federike speaking a bit more about that because we are really proud of the research you're doing because we can use it directly in our clinical work, and we have safety proof and efficacy proof. So how did you start at that and? So what we do, um, I work at the University of Basel in the lab of Matthias Lierti, and what we mostly do is phase one studies. We also have a small part that is doing phase two studies, but we largely do phase one studies. And um, this research started uh, years ago with MDMA and then shifted into LSD research in about 2015, or other psychedelics as well, but, but we fo focus a lot on, on LSD. And therefore, we have we have conducted <laughs> many <laughs> many <laughs> studies, <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> many many phase one studies, who, is partic who are particularly also looking at safety and um, emphasizing how people are feeling during these experiences. And I think this adds a lot of knowledge that can also be used, for example, to discuss these things with the BAG or in a larger sense to. Um, to, to use it and to see, yes, these substances are safe when we use them 
in a supervised setting. We don't know about non-supervised setting, but in supervised settings, which is important for medicalization and also for the use in the patients, we can see that it is that's, uh, quite safe. Yes, and then we also have, as I said, a small part that's focusing on, on phase two studies, and we have recently conducted an LSD anxiety study um, together with Peter Gosser. It was just published, and there we also focused on the safety adverse events. Um, we looked closely at it, and we did see um, we have hardly any serious adverse events that are um, related to the to the drug itself. Sometimes um, some are coming up. For example, there was a patient with with quite severe delusions during his trip, but then we know this happens and we can, we can see how we can work this out and we know that generally it doesn't, but that it's not like you cannot give it to everyone and expect it to be safe. Thank you so much. So just to give you an idea on um, who we are dealing with, uh, in this Netflix series that is a sign of this uh, psychedelic renaissance mm -hmm. for the whole world that just came out in July, Frederike is appearing. <laughs> so uh, imagine... Uh, uh, yeah, as well, uh, thank you. So just uh, imagine the place that this country has in this field. So this is just another sign of that. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, thanks a lot, super interesting. Um, there, there is a lot of mention, obviously, of the compassionate use. Uh, so on one it's a limited uh, medical use. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to... Right, the, the limited use. And also uh, the legal path of legalization through medical uh, phase one, two, and three uh, validation. Um, so that's on one hand. And then on the other hand, there is a recreational uh, and legal use, obviously, uh, and there is a lot of abuse uh, still now, I mean, especially by young people in recreational settings. So there is probably a reason for this law to be, to, to be such as it is. Then there is the, the last part, I believe, or very important one, and that uh, a few participants have mentioned, is uh, the, the role that psychedelics can play in spirituality uh, and mysticism. Uh, where, uh, which probably there is, we lack a lot of in today's society. Like you just go to a church and you, you can have very good ID. Like it's pretty much empty. Um, and so the question I have is, um, and I really have no answer on that, but how could psychedelics uh, be administered and also regulated in such a way that it could be used for mysticism purpose, like not only like once people have an illness or a trauma or uh, depression, but before that, uh, um, in more uh, maybe a preventive way, uh, uh, so that people can develop their spirituality. Uh, and in a way where it doesn't end up with, you know, rave parties for, you know, 16 years old. Um, any idea on that? Cause so this was a panel on contemporary issues on policy regulation and access. <laughs> this uh, question maybe can touch this, uh, um, the, the goal of this panel around, uh, for example, the religious use of some particular communities that would like to use um, these substances uh, even if they are uh, <laughs> being in Switzerland, for example? Well, uh, as a joke, religious use won't be uh, reimbursed by insurance. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, I think this is, this is useful to say to do the, um, yeah, the differences. And as you said, every substances are going to be abused in some ways but we have to do these clear differences. And then there's the question of the medication of substances and the question of the law. Is it allowed to drink alcohol or is it prohibited? And there's two uh, distinct things we can do. And for example, in cannabis, it goes uh, side by side, but it's a different things and path. you can add a, a different, path. different path. And I think the, the Federal Council has very clearly expressed uh, itself that uh, we, as you mentioned also, Thorns, we want to have medical and recreational use separated for drugs. Um, 
drugs, when we talk about drug policy, nor, uh, usually regular people always think about uh, recreational use or abuse or dependence, but rarely about the medical use. And drugs have always both sides. Uh, we want to separate it, but I don't, wouldn't agree that this is very perfectly possible. Mm -hmm. I'm very much for the the, the um, uh, for for keeping a clear medical system with clear criteria, and but on the other hand, there will always be a medical use that is outside of the medical realm mm -hmm. of substances. There is self-medication, even with uh, opioids, uh, trauma, traumatized yeah, people. That, that, we know about it, so um, I think it's not perfectly possible, but that's the, po the political objective. And uh, to turn back to your question, uh, in the US we have, uh, in certain states, we, or maybe even on a, a federal level, I'm not sure, we have a possibility to, um, to legalize substances for spiritual purposes. In the Swiss law, that doesn't exist. We have exactly two purposes which are also inscribed in the international narcotics law, in the single convention, and it's uh, for, for scientific use and it's for medical use. And uh, I mean, the question is uh, as simple as that. This had to be changed in the law. Uh, we have a direct democratic system uh, and uh, people would have to agree on, on another purpose. But I, I, when you ask me, as a, not as a representative of, um, of the state, <laughs> uh, I would say uh, if it's in a clear uh, spiritual context, we know about these churches in, in Brazil, etc., using ayahuasca, uh, that there can be abuse, but it can also work. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and, and this is a, so a question of the society, a cultural question, whether we want to have adult people or whether we want to give adult people access to substances for spiritual purposes. Right now, the answer is no in the law. It's just a le legal <laughs> answer. That's interesting that you're mentioning like our democratic system. So um, I think it's also about uh, science communication and the general uh, perception of these drugs. So for example, when I worked in Franz Vollenweider's lab and we did this meditation and psilocybin trials in the monastery, the headlines of the newspapers would be University of Zurich is um, organizing uh, drug camps. <laughs> and <laughs> this type of headlines has really changed um, towards, <laughs> yeah, a bit maybe too much hypey positive, but uh, the general perception of psychedelics has changed dramatically over the last years, I would say. If this is a foundation for some... Um, political changes, maybe. I, I had a question, but I, I would like to answer to you. You said about uh, drugs are widely used in recreational settings, but uh, I think it's a, it's a difference between the psychedelics and what people use. Uh, we have this Swiss uh, Sucht monitoring, uh, a monitoring on drug use, and uh, the five uh, mostly used uh, substances are alcohol, tobacco, uh, cannabis, cocaine, and on fifth place, it's uh, MDMA. And uh, psilocybin and LSD are on place 10 and 11. So that's completely different drugs people use in uh, recreational settings, and uh, the harms are much more. Than, uh, than the substances used for, for therapy. And uh, as you said, the, the media, they, they don't uh, distinguish between the substances. They say a trip and uh, drugs. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, we, we need to work also on, uh, um, how do you say that, um, the, how, how people uh, know the, the, the substances and to, perhaps we, we have to be careful with the word drug or use uh, words like uh, uh, psychedelic, uh, assisted therapy and, uh, yeah. and the question I have is, I have studied the, the forms uh, on, uh, on the homepage of the BAG uh, to, uh, um, for this uh, exceptional use or limited Use and there is a question. Uh, you have to indicate the source where you you get the substance, and uh, 
Is, is there a source where we can get it? Can we uh, uh, write down uh, University of Geneva, University Hospital? <laughs> so if, if I have a patient uh, who meets uh, the criteria for this limited use, uh, what sources are there to uh, get these substances? Obviously, there are sources. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we, we cannot... The question for... The, it might be a bit of an awkward question, but the point is that we can only authorize um, uh, the use of substance if it's clear from where it comes, where it goes. The whole chain of use has to be clear. That's the point. Um, but I'm sure my colleague on the left can also comment. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there are... Um, the, 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 the Swiss Society for uh, Psycholytic Therapy can certainly also advise you on, on this. I cannot make a public uh, um, advertisement here. <laughs> I'm not going to do one either. But, um, but I think you can like, get in touch with the, with the Swiss Medical yeah. Society and, uh, and get to know them and they will most likely inform you. Where, where, where the sources are, how you can apply, and, and how all this, how this whole process works, because it's not you, you, it's a process. It's not just one form. It's just, yeah. Also for quality assurance and reasons that not everyone who has never been in touch with these substances thinks, oh, oh, now I have a patient. Oh, I read somewhere something about oh, psilocybin and depression goes to the BAG homepage and it's like, oh, I fill this out and then there's magically coming a psychedelic <laughs> to him <laughs> and this works. No, there's, it's it's a process and it should be kept a process for my opinion. Maybe a side note on that, we will in late November have a conference also in Bern uh, for practitioners ma uh, mainly, um, where you can also get in touch with uh, people working in the field uh, with patients. 24th of November. Advertisement. <laughs> sure. Hi. So, can I go? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank you so much for asking your question. I was just about to ask a question quite similar. Um, so I work as a guide with uh, plant medicine, uh, cacao mostly, and I feel like when we when we're saying that uh, to ask for a psychedelic use, we need to prove like PTSD and stuff. I'm I'm asking myself, and I would love to have your opinion, like. The, the plant medicines, such as ayahuasca or other plants, in the traditional use, people go not because they have a disease sometimes, but they go for healing, right? They go for understanding, for everybody has something to heal in a sense. So I'm asking myself, um, isn't this opening with psychedelics in Switzerland and other countries an opportunity to open another idea of... Uh, of healing in a sense. We have alternative therapies in Switzerland that are reimbursed by certain ins insurances. And so I'm wondering, like, are we, are we um, getting psychedelics as a medicine into the actual medicine system and that's how it's gonna be? Or do you feel like there's an opening to like um, use it in a way that's more conscious to other uh, thematics? In human beings how do you feel about that I think first this will be strict a medical um, for medical application it's it's the way it will work and it will first be a medicalization but then maybe as you already said we have a we have a direct democracy maybe if these substances lose a little bit um, their stigma um, there might be there might be change uh, there might be chances opening up for that, and also maybe for self optimization etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean it 's not sometimes it 's like not only as you said, everyone has something to be healed it 's not only um, usually only psychiatric people go and have a psychotherapy. you can also have a psychotherapy as a healthy person, so maybe at some point this will change, but I think it will be a long process, mm. so I think right now. Maybe a side note on that. So uh, technically, um, these substances are uh, a medication, so the application has to be done by a medical doctor. But in practice, uh, medical doctors also work together with psychotherapists. Um, yeah, for example, when we offer groups or so, 
but the the application process and the responsibility as long as it's a medicalization process will remain with the medical doctor i'm not going into the judging the 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 purpose outside of the medical realm um, that's not my job but i just would like to to um, remind you also about the risks uh, now we had a huge um, or a significant corpus of research in the 60s on, on psychedelics, and it suddenly stopped. Why did it stop? Because there was this huge hype around psychedelics, which were, was outside of the medical realm, and now, because we see a very strong potential there, I think it would be very um, uh, it would be wise to, to really get this done, I'm saying, uh, to get the medical part done. So, so we have uh, research on this. We can really use these substances where they are needed the most. And I'm not saying that the other, um, other needs are not relevant, but it's also a risk. You know, we, we see when you look uh, in, on YouTube or any kind of channels, what, what, what kind of lifestyle um, um, uh, cl um, propositions around psychedelics exist these days and um, I think such a hype has a huge risk and I'm not talking about what you said is, is part of this hype it can be a quite a, it's, it's a relevant uh, it's a relevant question but um, I'm just seeing also the risks and I would prefer that psychedelics are really now um, uh, researched properly for medical use before we risk again uh, a backlash in society. I'm curious about um, a bit of the atmosphere in the Bay, okay? <laughs> like, uh, as far as you can tell, like, is it more of a, this is a, a kind of a dynamic that's going and at some point it comes from the US and it's gonna be legal or are the thresholds in most, yeah, of your peers high still? And like maybe a sub question, I'm uh, rather a newcomer to the community, so I'm using this status to, uh, to maybe also raise a taboo question that, um, uh, so it's illegal to use it oneself, uh, those substances, but I guess uh, most therapists uh, want to know how it works, as also Rick, for example, said. And um, is there um, like a pros uh, perspective that it might be legalized for people who are therapists to, um, you know, gain knowledge on how it works for the, the treatment use. <laughs> About the the the, um, <laughs> the mood in the or the the <laughs> atmosphere <laughs> in the OFSP after uh, two years of co pandemic, I'm not gonna <laughs> <laughs> dig into that. I think <laughs> some people also need psychedelics now. <laughs> 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 The, I think we are excited about uh, the developments uh, from a research perspective. People in the OFSP, when it comes to work, are very sober. They, 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 we are, I just, what I said before, we also see the potential backlashes and risks because we are in a political context. And uh, we have also some, of course, uh, uh, legal projects. And then uh, you want to have things get done and, uh, and, and really not threaten uh, all these developments again. So I'm very glad when professionals uh, speak out for a very rigid uh, or, or clear criteria, good formation, etc. cetera. Um, so sober perspective on the issue from a pro professional point of view. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the question, uh, use of psychedelics for uh, formations of therape uh, therapeuts, that's a fair question. Uh, and the answer is the law doesn't allow it. Probably you heard about it. I mean, it would mean a uh, um, um, an um, adoption of the, the law. Um, as I said, it's, it's really two, two um, um, reasons. Uh, it's uh, research and it's medical use and limited medical use. And the, re and the research part could be the answer that's what I can say, if you are a, a therapist and uh, participate in a, in, a, in a serious study that is approved, uh, of course, you can also get some kind of uh, experience for, um, for uh, your professional work afterwards. But that's part of a study. And it's certainly not the same context, maybe. If it's not the part of the research question, 
the therapeutical context or what, if it's really a, cl a classical clinical study where you go into, uh, I don't know, executive functions or what, I mean, if this is really then so ap uh, applicable to your clinical context, I'm not sure, but I'm sure you can talk more about it from a practical perspective. Well, it's a, it's a big question and it, it comes every time here and I think there's no real answer yet. I think, as uh, Dublin said before, it shouldn't be mandatory, but if the people would like to do it, it should can do it in a legal settings without being afraid of having the wrong substances or being uh, attacked and or having his license uh, uh, off. So one of the best way would be to do research actually on how it will change the therapist and I hope Federico will do this research because it's part of his PhD so <laughs> now he has a, a second public engagement in doing this research but this is how we start and if in this research we really see that uh, the therapists who benefit from it are better therapists or they know their clients better then we'll see but it's a, it's a big question. In psychotherapy, every psychiatrist has to do a personal work. And if you look at the literature, it's very difficult to, see, to say, okay, everybody knows that having yourself a, a psychiatric experience is better, but in terms of how better you are with patients, it's kind of difficult to prove. So I'm not sure we're going to have the definitive proof, but at least we're going to have the proof that it doesn't arm the people and they like it. Because this is also what is important. Most of the people, most of the psychiatrists or uh, psychotherapists who have done a personal work, they all say, "Okay, it was important for me, and it helps me to to deal with my clients." I would like to point out that there are at the moment already legal uh, options for therapists in other countries, or also uh, not with the uh, psychedelics, but for example with holotropic breathwork, with ketamine. That's uh, in question. So there are ways uh, um, additional to the participation in studies. And I would also agree that most practitioners agree that as a psychotherapist, you yourself go through psychotherapy. So from this um, uh, contextual psychotherapeutic paradigm, um, it just makes sense to have uh, self-experience. Um, but I think like the foundation or the most uh, fundamental thing is also uh, just a general therapeutic attitude. So just because the therapist goes through a, a self-experience doesn't necessarily mean that he does a better job than someone else who's uh, there with a, an open heart and empathy and understanding. Uh, but it's certainly a, an issue uh, in the training of therapists. I think uh, this this is really important, and that's why we we have to do research. It's also to design the future structure of these trainings. So if we can get to understand what are the the best ways to train uh, psychedelic therapists, uh, then we can implement them. But uh, you do this uh, with the methodology of science that tries to get rid of the most uh, subjective bias possible. That's one uh, part or one perspective. You can also do qualitative research, for example. And then you have <laughs> <And> different... Uh, <laughs> take into in account the the contextual factors as well. I have a question concerning the multidisciplinarity of the studies, because I think one of the key issues to make this topic more political is precisely to bring it down to the civil society. So people can start discussing about it instead of calling these substances drugs, rather medicines, and see what's the potential of their own access, like going beyond the conservative uh, thoughts we still have about them. So is how to get involved other sciences, like sociology, political sciences, and other schools and disciplines that can contribute to that to happen? Well, I guess this conference is really a very nice example of bringing all the people from different fields together. Uh, I guess before we had a philosophist, we have someone from the administration, so we should go on on this, on this way. And what about, but I mean, how to trickle it down? Like we are here because we, in one way or the other, we do research about it, but like the people who are out there, like how to bring it to a more 
broader public because still the beliefs of these being drugs and it being illegal or criminal are way bigger than the fact that there is potential for us to heal. Yeah. Well, Netflix will help, <laughs> <laughs> but for sure. Mm. Yeah, I think that's um, a process. You start somewhere, you do serious research, it will get eventually medicalized, and then the broader public will get to know what what is all about these substances, but it like doesn't happen just like that. It's 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 a process. And uh, additional to that, we are also talking about the Michael Pollan effect of increased <laughs> expectations. So I think just because everyone is hyping about it, it's also not necessarily good for the <laughs> like uh, implementation and realistic expectations and uh, actual care for patients. I think we, we're also in a global world where the public opinion about drugs is shifting and the war on drugs is not over, but thinking about the war on drugs is not um, the best way now. And if you look at how it changed with cannabis, I mean, that might show the way to have a more um, a broader... Uh, approach to those products and be more in the integrative way of using it than in the legal or uh, criminal way of seeing those substances. Yes. Hello, I have a question uh, concerning the system of uh, using psychedelics in therapy before having official approval. So, in my opinion, the system in Switzerland is working very well, but uh, if we will look at other countries, for example, Germany, with a much higher population, and it's not so small, not everyone knows everyone, uh, do you think the same system would work in bigger countries, or are there some changes, you would say, after some years of experience with this system that should be applied? Well, obviously... In other countries, it should be a legalized drug, as we said, and it should be MD, uh, approved. So when it's going to be approved in the U.S., it's going to be approved in other country, and I think that's the first step. But I don't know if you think it... I mean, Germany has a much bigger administration, e even if it's also a federal uh, system. So uh, I'm sure you're gonna, you could handle also exceptional authorizations, system like that. I think you had something similar for uh, cannabis before it was uh, medically, um, uh, the ban on medical cannabis was lifted uh, some, when was it, some five, six years ago. So um, it's not excluded because of the size, I would say. Um, of course, um, depends on the cultural context also, which system. I just, um, it came to my mind that there is already a, an example where uh, where um, psychedelics are now legal for uh, spiritual use more or, or more so para-therapeutic outside of the medical um, realm and it's in, uh, it's in uh, Oregon. So um, for us it's always interesting to see what's going on in other uh, jurisdictions and we're going to learn from these jurisdictions um, Switzerland has been a, a pioneer in drug policy for many years, but now we are learning from other countries and uh, we don't always have uh, to make the first step. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we're we certainly going to see what happens there. Yes, here. Um, so there is another use case I, re I uh, recently discovered uh, about the psychedelic, which is for the um, a neurolog neurological uh, disease called uh, cluster headache, which uh, is uh, quite prevalent, one every thousand people, and that produces for these people one of the most, I mean, what they say, one of the most uh, painful experience that a human can live. And it has been shown with qualitative, not, there is not a lot of clinical study, but it has been shown with exploratory, exploratory data and uh, a qualitative study that uh, psychedelic are really um, effective in the way of preventing those uh, cluster edges to happen, while the typical uh, legal drugs have only an effect, I mean, it can only be used during the attack. And I was wondering if uh, this people with, those, with this syndrome can uh, access to these drugs. 
uh, with the limited use uh, provided by Switzerland, meaning that they don't need um, a therapy with it. They just need the pharmacological effect. And just to give you an example, we have a testimony uh, in Geneva last week about someone who had suffered this condition and he was using LSD uh, every day with uh, 200 micrograms. So after a few days, he had uh, no effect at all, but it was still helping him uh, uh, reducing his, his suffering. So there is actually um, a study with cluster headache going on at the University Hospital Basel. It's led uh, by, by Dr. Jasmin Schmidt. And um, I think it's currently in the middle of the study, so that so we have it we have it on the radar. radar. It's a it's a it's a um, it's there's being research done on it. And I think there is also in uh, in other countries in the world. I think in Denmark there's also been conducted a study in cluster headache and 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 psilocybin. So that's on the radar. And I think for for the limited use program, um, the there if if a physician thinks that he wants to, or that this could be an option, they can uh, they can write to the BAG and get an exceptional license on that. I, I mean, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. no, it's, it's clear um, that uh, in the law there is no limitation of the indication, and we we already approved um, a cluster headache. Uh, um, uh, authorizations for the use of cluster headache patients, but I'm not very sure at now, right now, if it's uh, just in the context of the studies or if it's uh, even for individual patients. But that's not exclusive at all, for sure. But we can, it's also not true that we can, that we would, it, it's an automatism when we, when we get a, um, a demand that we can authorize. Normally, we want to see some kind of, um, reasoning, some kind of evidence, doesn't have to be phase three studies, but some kind of reasoning why it should be, why, why that makes sense for these patients, what is the evidence, what are the limited studies that we have. And uh, if there is no evidence, then it's for us uh, in the area of studies. I mean, if, if, if even in the very lim the most limited case would be a case study, a case report. Uh, if, if it's in a, uh, just experimental and we have no ad evidence at all or just from the um, clinical experience or the recreational experience of people, then we, we ask uh, um, physicians to, 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 have a, to make a study or conduct a study uh, as, a, as a minimum and, or a case report. That's really the, the, the least that has to be done. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the great panel. Um, uh, you were speaking earlier about uh, phase one clinical trials, uh, Frederica. Uh, I'm not too familiar with um, the European medical system in general. So um, when you say phase one, do you mean phase one with the EMA? And if something gets approved by the EMA, does that mean that it's approved for all countries in the EU? Does that also include um, Switzerland and the UK? Um, so a bit of a naive question about the European medical system. Switzerland is not in the EU, so we have a <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so we don't work with the EMA. Um, so phase one means uh, healthy participants. Um, we see, we give the drug, and we look how does this react in a how how do the participants react to this drug. Phase two would be a small population of patients, and phase three would be a larger um, a larger trial. So in Switzerland, if we if we conduct these studies, um, of course, to get an approval, we have to have to, have to go on until phase three, unless, um, as you said before, um, if it's approved in another country, we can implement it into Switzerland. I think no, no country, no OECD country would accept phase one studies from another country as uh, for anything. I mean, this is only if it's approved, if it's authorized in, in terms of the therapeutic law, that it can then be, if the EMA is uh, approving a substance, it's also accessible in Switzerland. Hello. Uh, here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have one question about another panel of uh, patients, uh, end of life, for example. I work in uh, palliative care, and uh, for two years now we are speaking more openly about uh, palliative care. So... My question is, how can we help some of the people that can be eligible to these uh, treatments? 
because for now the, the, it's a very time-consuming procedure and that this, those patients don't have that time. So can something be done? Can something be more uh, facilitating the access of this? Also, um, in some um, palliative care centers, we don't, I'm working as a volunteer, so lots of people are working as volunteers. So we cannot always bring somebody to the hospital or to, to somebody to, to get the therapy. And um, can be some kind of um, training for um, the people who are working in these uh, kind of homes. Um, not training as a therapist, but training as a, maybe as a sitter, uh, along with a doctor during a therapy. How can we help these people, for example? Thank you. I think there are palliative care um, doctors in the audience that have experience with uh, limited use. But your specific question about um, training as a sitter, I think that is more. So, I mean, it's still a, it's a, it's a, these substances are still, and also the limited use program, it's a, it's a medical process. A physician has to prescribe it or ask for the for the exceptional um, license, and then, of course, in also I think also in the in the training program of the of the medical society in Switzerland, we there are not only physicians. I think there are also um, psychologists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so that could eventually become an option. But um, yes, th this has not been formalized yet or anything. For the prescription and the administration of these drugs, uh, there needs to be a physician that is in charge. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, other other personnel cannot be imp implicated in the therapy. I mean that depends on the on the on the therapy that is uh, is chosen. Um, with regards to the um, administra administrative load, the uh, the the bureaucracy involved in that, of course, there is some uh, hurdles, but again, uh, this is something that the lawmakers wanted because they thought they were probably of the opinion that these are very risky drugs and um, the special precaution should be taken. Um, uh, there is no good, um, there is no big uh, uh, clinical evi um, study, um, study evidence, empirical evidence for effectiveness yet, but it's coming, that's for sure, um, in some, for some indications. And uh, as long as it's not there and it's not uh, accessible, um, it's not authorized in the therapeutic, under the therapeutical products law, um, the lawmaker said that there should be precautions and uh, somebody should check that again. There was also, there is also uh, cases of abuse, we also have to know. Um, and uh, one question was also uh, th whether we can withdraw these authorizations. Of course we can withdraw them. We can immediately withdraw them if there is any um, issue that, uh, that um, requires a withdrawal. But normally, and uh, all the, the physicians that are involved in these, um, in these regimes uh, know, can, can approve it or can uh, testify um, for us, it's important that the responsibility, like for any therapy, is in the hands of the physician. It's the primary responsibility, it's the therapeut, and uh, the authorization is a second uh, control wh whether some formal uh, aspects are checked. But to, to go back on specific, um, the specific field, I, I think there are many questions in many fields, like uh, neurology, uh, palliative care, and if this is a big issue, I think it is. I mean, the specialist palliative care doctor, they should write an article on how difficult it is to have it on time, and that's the way the science moves, and do some study. I think do more study. If you do a study, you can have the substance here, and you, so that would be the start, I think. Okay, thank you. So, thank you very much. Maybe a last question. I, um, Maybe in that case, yeah. Here on the left, Thank you. Um, a question again 
more clearly regarding to policy and regulation would be I feel like we've been talking about ideal scenarios, step one, step two, step three, logical um, follow-ups uh, that inevitably lead to something. Now, coming back to a political reality, and maybe that's for you, Mr. Schwent, to give us some insight. Um, where do you see the challenges in terms of um, the political spectrum ideologies from left to right that might influence such decisions or processes on the one hand and on the other hand where do you might where do you see potential challenges when it comes to lobbying particularly given that here in Switzerland um, there there might be very high density of pharmaceutical companies given the size of the country so do you see any challenges when it comes to those two factors and political decision-making when it comes to psychedelics? I'm not going to comment on uh, certain political spectrums. That's not my, my role. Mm -hmm. um, but what we can observe is certainly that this discussion is more... I mean, of course, uh, people here are all very um, interested in the subject. They are, they, they are professionally related to the subject. So you, you also overestimate uh, the, imp uh, the 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 um, degree of the discussion in the general population, like uh, we always think, wow, there are many media demands and there's a lot of interest and a lot of citizen demands, but uh, when you look at the society overall, this is still a very special issue discussion, um, and I think probably it will probably the medical part is opening as as it was said, it opening the door for a more uh, more rational discussion on these issues. Um, with cannabis, our approach from the Federal Office of Public Health was always to be, to keep to the facts. I mean, we, we can never avoid any ideological discussions <laughs> in the society, in, in politics or in this broader society. But we always try to bring uh, the discussion back to the facts, show what what um, the proofs are. And I think with the medical cannabis, we manage quite well to to show the risks and the, the potentials and and um, and manage to manage to de this discussion as far as it's possible to be managed but in the end the, the the society has to be ready for certain steps it's always the same same um, uh, story uh, what was the last part of the question the the second part was the, uh, the pharmaceutical lobbying. industry yeah. the f well, also there, I don't have to, it's not a very, it's not an open, it's not a secret if I say that, uh, of course, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is important in Switzerland. And, um, for example, um, some politicians wanted the Federal Office of Public Health or the, the, the state to conduct some pharmaceutical studies, clinical studies with drugs that are not uh, where there is not a big commercial interest, uh, where there is not a big business case, because uh, the, 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 when when we, when we talk about pharmaceutical industry, you need to patent um, drugs or treatments. Otherwise, you cannot get the return of, on investment of, of a, cl a clinical phase four studies. It's su such a costly thing. That's the whole system. But um, we cannot do it because we no have no legal grounds to conduct any um, uh, research on drugs or develop drugs from the side of the state. And that's certainly because um, we have uh, an industry th that is very potent and th that doesn't like it to be this way, probably. I mean, for a long ter time it was also not necessary, but we see certain um, categories of drugs like, I'm now leaving a bit the area of psychedelics, for example, uh, uh, the, the, um, um, we have a problem with, um, with uh, antibiotics. Uh, there is more and more resistant, uh, resistance to, to classical antibiotics and there needs to be much more research, but it's not a business case. Um, and that's a certain problem we have in all the, mo the Western, uh, let's say, um, medical systems that uh, research is highly expensive and if there is not a business case, there is no research. So probably this is a discussion that has to be led broader. And with the psychedelics, we have a similar problem because uh, the patenting of these drugs is very difficult. So thank you so much uh, to our speakers.
for being there. That was the last question. <laughs> Sometimes uh, that's how it is. It was, uh, I think, a real pleasure, uh, a proof that we can really dialogate in a very consistent man manner on things like, uh, like this. Thank you so much uh, again. Uh, as for the rest uh, of the night, uh, um, we will have a pause now and then at 9 p.m. Uh, there will be the projection of this movie I showed you this, uh, this um, yeah, previously. Aware Glimpses of Consciousness. We see there some, um, an interdisciplinary perspective uh, from uh, different people involved uh, in different uh, uh, research and activities around altered state of consciousness and consciousness itself. And um, yeah, that would be it uh, for today. Tomorrow we start again at um, 9 and then the first talk will be at 9.30. If you still need some information, you just go to the Alps Info table and uh, I wish you a very fine night. Thank you.